Hello, everyone, and welcome. So nice to see you all and to see you really in person um, after all of this time. Um, um, my name is Carly Kind, and I'm the director of the Ada Lovelace Institute. As most of you will know, the Ada Lovelace Institute was established in 2018 by the Nuffield Foundation to be an independent research institute with a remit to ensure that data and AI work for people and society. We use a socio-technical evidence-based approach and we use deliberative methods to convene and center diverse and interdisciplinary voices in complex debates about data and technology. We are so honored to have you here today to mark the culmination of a three-year program of work on the governance of biometrics technologies, which we formally launched right here at the Royal Society in 2020, January of 2020. Um, a couple of housekeeping notes. Firstly, thank you to the Royal Society and particularly Arik Chowdhury for uh, hosting us and helping us organize today. Um, Channel 4 is filming, as I think you will have been made aware by email. Um, they are filming the speakers, they won't be filming the audience, and they won't be filming the Q&A, except for one question which we might um, allow them from the, uh, from the Channel 4 crew. We are also awaiting Chiyomura MP, who will hopefully join us shortly and also has to leave because of the inevitable restraints of Parliament uh, in terms of time. So we'll excuse her if she kind of drops in and drops out when she needs to. Hopefully she'll be here shortly. Um, so we are launching two new publications today, as you know. Uh, Matthew Ryder QC's Independent Legal Review of the Governance of Biometrics and a policy report by the Ada Lovelace Institute, which draws on the review as well as research we've done uh, on, a, in particular, public engagement research. By way of background, when we were first establishing ADA in the summer of 2019, biometrics was a clear choice for us in terms of the first major research program that we would in, embark upon, because there was a growing disquiet about the introduction of, in particular, live facial recognition technologies into policing capabilities. And there was an ongoing and quite lively public conversation about facial recognition more broadly, off the back of some stories around the inaccuracies in facial recognition technology with respect to uh, people, uh, non-white and non-male faces, and also about the deployment of facial recognition technology in other spaces outside of policing. You might remember there was a big news story about the King's Cross development using facial recognition in and around the public areas there. So it was clearly an issue that was starting to um, infiltrate public conversation, and it felt like an issue that was really ripe for an institute like ADA, which had a remit to really understand what does society want when it comes to these new technologies. So this wasn't mostly or primarily even about facial recognition in policing, although that was the trigger. This was also about well, primarily about a new technology that had the potential to change the relationship between citizens and the state, and also between uh, workers and their employers, between children and teachers, and between people and technology companies. So I really want to emphasize that this is, welcome Chi, this is a, <laughs> um, I want to emphasize that this is not a technical or a legalistic issue. This is a deeply human issue. It is about how humans are made legible, um, categorizable, identifiable by technology to each other, to companies, to their employers, to government and to police. Um, so it's not only something that protesters are worried about when they're going to demonstrate, but it's also of concern to prospective employees who are now undergoing virtual job interviews in which their facial expressions are measured and conclusions are purportedly drawn about their reliability, for example, or their trustworthiness. It's about parents who are looking at a future of education in which their children may be assessed through technology for how well they're paying attention in class, for example. Um, and it's about how these technologies work for everyone. So we heard lots of early stories about the inaccuracies in some recognition technologies on black faces, for example. But we also heard from disabled communities about how this type of technology might offer them new, new chances to engage with services, but also might exclude them if it's not designed correctly. So we wanted to understand, is there a social license for biometrics technology? From our initial public attitudes research, we heard that people's perspectives were really contingent on context, 
on place and also on what safeguards were available and, and in place at the time. And so we went on to commission and run the Citizens Biometrics Council, which Maddie will tell you more about. But we also wanted to understand what the law currently requires, uh, what it currently protects and where the gaps are. And so for that reason, we commissioned Matthew Ryder QC to undertake an independent review of the governance of biometrics data in England and Wales. And in this regard, we see directly on a recommendation from the House of Commons Science and Technology Committee who had in summer 2019 asked government to undertake such an independent review. Matthew and his team, including Samuel Rowe, Javier Ruiz and Jessica Joan, most of whom are here today, interviewed witnesses, conducted research and worked with an advisory board to evaluate the existing legal frameworks and oversight structures and to come up with a set of recommendations uh, which identify and seek to address gaps. So over the next hour, we will hear from Matthew about his review, uh, Ada researcher Maddie Chang about the following work that Ada has done, and we'll hear reflections from three individuals whose roles span oversight, the House of Lords and the House of Commons about their reflections on this work. We're also really pleased to have a member of the Citizens Biometrics Council, which was the public deliberation initiative we convened, um, to speak from their own personal perspective on these issues. Um, and with that, uh, it's my honour to introduce Matthew Ryder QC to present the findings from his review. Matthew, as you will know, is a senior QC at Matrix Chambers uh, with well-established expertise in human rights, data and information, regulatory and criminal law, including terrorism. From 2016 to 2018, he was appointed to the full-time role of Deputy Mayor of London for Social Integration by the Mayor of London, leading several teams in the Mayor's work on diversity and social mobility and overseeing the work of the Mayor's data team. Matthew, of course, has led the review for the past few years and we are excited to hear from him today. Thank you. Uh, well, it is a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Carly. Uh, and we're very excited that after some delays, some very long delays caused by the pandemic. We started in 2020 thinking we were going to go breezing through to the end of 2020, and it took us a lot longer than that. We finally managed to get the report to you today, so we're all extremely excited. Um, I have to do some thank yous to begin with because it has been such a lot of work. So first of all, thank you to the team, Jessica Jones, Javier Ruiz and Sam Rowe. Javier and Sam are here, Jessica isn't, but they were uh, absolutely uh, relentless in making sure that we got everything done, including organizing all the consultee interviews, which was very important. Thank you, of course, to Ada um, and to Carly, especially for commissioning the independent review, and also to many Ada, Imogen, Parker, Octavia Reeve, Madeline Chang, and Sohil Malik, who are here as well, who've just been fantastic, in this, especially in this final phase. Uh, we had a really uh, great advisory board, which was very important for us, because although we were lawyers, uh, and uh, Javier has some uh, serious expertise in human rights um, consultancy work. Um, we did need those who are experts in the technical field to review our work as it went along. And so Lillian Edwards, Annika Lucassen, uh, Marion Oswald, Matthew Rice, Renata Sampson, Pamela Aguadike, and Edgar Whiteley uh, were very, very helpful to us, and we're extremely grateful to all of them. And we're really grateful to the consultees. It was uh, a real privilege to be able to interview and engage with uh, people over a, a wide range of areas of uh, expertise and policy and practice that connected with this work and with this area. Um, in particular, I, all the consultees are in the annexes to the report, so I won't mention them all. But it, it's worth noting that we have particular, we were particularly struck by the openness and the level of information that was shared with us by the outgoing biometrics commissioner, uh, Professor Paul Wiles and the outgoing surveillance camera commissioner, Tony Porter. And if you go through our report, I think you'll find that their evidence to us was really powerful and very insightful. Uh, we're grateful, obviously, to Silky Carlo, um, who's here as well, who gave Big Brother Watch his view, because they are a very important group uh, in the work that they do. But there were many others on the other side of that debate, for example, for example Lindsay Cheswick from the Metropolitan Police, who also engaged with us very openly. And we were very grateful that the police were willing to discuss with us their perspective on the issues, which we thought was a very important way of progressing this debate. Um, there's only a few minutes, so I'm not going to go into a, a huge amount of detail, but um, I'd like to just say a few points, because I think uh, a lot of what I'm going to say is in the review document, in our report, and you'll see a summary which sets out our 10 recommendations, 
And so I'm not going to go through all of that in a lot of detail. But I will just touch on some matters which I think might be quite helpful before you read it, because you're all going to read the 200 pages of it, <laughs> not just the summary. Um, but most of it's legislation, copy that, don't worry. Um, so first of all, we are very proud of this um, piece of work, uh, partly because it hasn't really been done before, and we felt it's a very important piece of work to be done. Uh, we believe this is the beginning of a debate. Uh, we're not seeking to pr provide a report which is a conclusive, final answer to these issues. This, we hope, is the beginning of how we discuss what we believe is one of the most important issues facing us in terms of law and society when it comes to how we progress through commerce, through human rights, through politics, through public governance. All of those areas are going to have to deal with how we handle biometric data, and we hope that our report starts to at least pull together the existing legislation and allows people to understand where we are so that we can work out where we want to go. Uh, we found while we were doing the report uh, that there were sort of three groups of people who uh, were, anybody who wasn't excited about our work, they tended to fall into three categories. The first were people who would say to us, well, yeah, but progress and security, innovation, commercial innovation and, and keeping us all safe is a bit more important than privacy. So why are you spending all this time worrying about biometric data when what we really should be worrying about is innovation and keeping everybody safe? And, of course, what we started to unpack during the review was that the two things do not pull against each other and that progress, innovation, and security and enhancing law enforcement are uh, sit completely comfortably alongside the need to have good data protection in relation to biometric data. The second group of people are people who would say, um, well, the public are consenting to all of this anyway. Um, and they talk about kids and social media and things like that. And say, you know, why are you so worried about biometric data? And we spent a lot of time unpacking what public consent really meant in this area. And I think you'll hear a lot more about that in relation to the Biometric Citizens Councils, which went really thoroughly into what it means to engage with the public generally and how the superficial notion of consent isn't really an answer. And the third group of people tended to be the ones that said, well, yeah, we agree with you, this is a serious issue, but everything's gone to hell anyway, so why should we bother about it? <laughs> and uh, we tried to be more optimistic than that <laughs> and uh, um, really try and provide something that provides a way forward optimistically rather than just kind of puts our heads down in despair. Uh, but more importantly, what we felt very strongly is this debate, particularly for those people who, um, politicians in particular, legislators, uh, people who work in policy areas, even journalists. Um, this debate isn't an intuitive debate in the way that some other types of rights are. We don't all really know instinctively where we stand on particular policy issues or where we should draw the lines because sometimes we don't have the same sort of information when it comes to something like biometric data and the rights that people have compared to something like the privilege against self-incrimination or liberty. Um, uh, the 10 recommendations, very quickly, uh, fall under uh, a few headings, but the urgent need for a new strategy framework, extending the same protections for both identification and classification when it comes to biometric data. That's quite an important technical, but quite an important recommendation. Thirdly, developing specific codes of practice on biometric data. Fourthly, a legally binding code of practice governing the use of live facial recognition which needs to be published as soon as possible. And of course, in March of this year, uh, the National Policing Council published a, a guidance note on live facial recognition. We think something stronger than that is needed. It's a good start, but we think something stronger than that is needed. Uh, fifthly, the use of live facial recognition should be suspended until those initial steps have, are in place. And that recommendation is not out of step mm. with the general consensus that we're seeing from the companies that make those products, as well as uh, law enforcement and other public uh, uh, authorities across the world. Sixth, we should not replace the existing duties that we have under the Human Rights Act, the Equality Act, and the Data Protection Act 2018 when we're formulating the new laws. Seventh, we think a biometric ethics board should be set up that follows the template that we see with local ethics board and consultations. And eighth, we believe that those ethics board decisions should be published and those public authorities which seek to depart from decisions of the ethics boards need to explain why. And that level of transparency we think is very important. 
Ninth, uh, we think there should be specific oversight of biometric data. It needs some form of specialist commissioner. Where that commissioner sits is a matter for debate, but we think it needs specialist oversight. And lastly, uh, we think there needs to be uh, further work when it comes to private sector use. We had initially intended for our review to cover both private and public sector. And what we found was that the level of uh, knowledge and understanding in relation to private use of, life of, sorry, of biometric data, including live facial recognition, was really much further back in terms of uh, organizations talking about it, uh, public authorities considering it, when compared to public sector use of biometric data. And so a lot of the debate that a lot of people would like to have around biometric use by companies, by commercial entities, uh, is something that we weren't in a position to examine because the learning isn't there. That worried us, and so our 10th recommendation is that work needs to be done. There is a further chapter of work that we think should follow, which focuses on private corporations. Um, so I think that really covers uh, a run-through of the, the headline points of the report. I think there's just uh, some final points I'd make. Uh, firstly, uh, we think it is very important that an issue like this, and one of the reasons is a barrister um, who litigates, I was keen to be involved in this work, is because litigation isn't really the way forward in this area. And we can talk about it in a bit more detail. But in reality, the way forward in this area is to have a better understanding of what the law is, a consensus about the need, about the need for change, and some form of structure in the way that we then uh, enact that change to make sure that everybody understands how we move forward. Secondly, and I feel quite strongly about this, I've mentioned this in the foreword to the report, we don't agree with those who believe that there is a, a complete tension between those who want to innovate with biometric data and those who want to protect privacy with biometric data. In fact, we believe quite strongly, and we found from the responses that we were getting, <coughs> that firm regulation helps innovation. Because once those who are innovating know where the hard lines are, they can innovate with some level of comfort and confidence. But self-regulation when it comes to difficult areas like human rights is not comfortable for large companies. And that's one of the reasons maybe why we're seeing large companies pulling back from their products being used because they are aware that they could be creating products that have the potential to do real harm and they want assistance in working out where the legal lines should be. And therefore, strong regulation, firm regulation, doesn't hinder innovation in this area, it can help innovation. Uh, and I think, uh, lastly, uh, I'd sort of like to say that the consensus that we found, uh, well, one, of, one of the points that uh, surprised us was that while the consultees were uh, very engaging, and while on some areas there was a lot of consensus, we were surprised that even those whose full-time work is in this area uh, sometimes had completely different views on what we thought would be uncontroversial topics. And to give you one example, uh, the case of Bridges from the Court of Appeal, uh, which found that the use of uh, live facial recognition by South Wales Constabulary was unlawful, uh, was described to us as a decision that it was lawful by, I won't mention, I won't mention who, but a stakeholder who you would think would be very, very interested in that decision and what the result of that decision was. And they were proceeding on the basis that the decision was the complete opposite from what it was. Now, that surprised us, but also made us aware that even those who are working in this area from time to time do not understand the complexities of some of the issues that they're dealing with. They need help, they need studies that go through the law, through the regulation, and they need better guidance on how to move forward in order to be able to carry out their job, and in order to be able to work effectively with biometric data. And so the, that's the sort of example that we found uh, not only slightly alarmed us, but also gave us confidence that the work that we were doing should be sparking debate that would move things forward and hopefully get consensus. Thanks. Thank you so much, Matthew. It's now my pleasure to welcome Maddie Chang, uh, Senior Policy Advisor at the Ada Lovelace Institute to present Ada's own policy report, which we have also published today, which brings together the findings from the writer review with our public engagement research. Maddie. Okay. 
Hi everyone, my name is Maddie Chang and I'm a senior policy advisor at the Ada Lovelace Institute and the lead researcher for this program of work. Which means that many of you have probably received a haranguing email from me or two or three in the last couple of months. All to say thank you so much for being here with us today. I'd like to start by setting the scene of biometric technologies. Firstly, what is biometric data? Biometric data relates to the physical characteristics of a person that can be measured, recorded, or quantified, often used to verify or establish someone's identity or to categorize people. Biometric technologies, by extension, use biometric data in combination with computational techniques Again, typically to verify someone's identity, identify them against a database of other people, or categorize a person. One thing that we draw on quite heavily in our report is that the scope of biometrics is growing. Traditionally, biometrics like fingerprints and DNA were used by police to identify individuals. We then saw law enforcement start to use facial recognition technology to identify people from digital representations of their face. We are now seeing new types of biometrics collected by new actors and in new places. We're seeing biometrics collected beyond face data, so data such as how we talk, how we walk, how we move our faces. I would clearly have a lot of uh, that to collect. Um, we're seeing biometrics used in situations beyond policing, in supermarkets, in schools, and in the workplace. We're also seeing biometrics increasingly used for purposes beyond simply identification, and instead for categorizing people into categories such as their status or their characteristics, and to do things such as emotion ID, which we must point out here is a pseudoscientific technique. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think that would get a laugh, but <laughs> just a fact. Um, for facial recognition technology, sorry, so, Given this growing reach of biometrics, particularly into daily life, the questions of their impact on society become even more urgent. For newer technologies, such as emotion ID, that claim to detect emotions from internal states, a basic set of questions persists. Do these technologies work? On what scientific basis do they function? And if they did work, are they desirable? For facial recognition technology, as we note in the report, simply improving the accuracy or validity such that it doesn't have bias built into the technology does not necessarily make it safe. Discrimination may still arise from the social context in which the technology is used, such as to over-surveil marginalized communities or to make decisions about people on an unfounded basis. In other words, the question is less, do these technologies work, and rather, should we use them? To this question of how should we use biometric technologies, we turned to members of the public. We began with a national survey of attitudes towards facial recognition technology. And then to understand people's opinions in greater depth, we convened the Citizens Biometric Council, led by my colleague Aidan Pepin, who's here in the front. The council ran for eight months and involved 50 members of the public who took part in over 60 hours of deliberative workshops. In the workshops, council members learned about biometric technologies from a wide range of experts, including police, regulators, civil society groups, and technology companies. They then deliberated and collectively came up with a set of recommendations. I'd like to share a few findings from across this public engagement research work. Firstly, the public considered biometric data uniquely sensitive. They noted that biometric data has an intimate and permanent nature relating to people's physical bodies and intertwined with people's experiences of their identity. Because of this sensitivity, even in cases where there is a perceived benefit, such as in limited cases of policing, people underscore the need for proportionality and for safeguards. Secondly, people's comfort largely depends on the context in which biometric technologies are used and the extent to which they are disproportionately affected by harms. In the survey, for example, people were comfortable using faces to unlock phones and for limited use by police, <laughs> while the majority of people were deeply opposed to the use of facial recognition in schools, shops, public transit, and in hiring. One person said, it just feels like a bit of overkill. 
It is there to prevent fraud and prevent crime, but I think there's probably other measures that could be done that don't need to use biometric data. Thirdly, the council explored some of the harms that biometric technologies raise. There was significant public concern about the negative impact of biometric technologies for free expression, free association, free assembly, and privacy, as well as concern about biometrics being used in a way that would exacerbate existing bias or discrimination in society. This concern not only stemmed from the well-known differential inaccuracy problem, i.e. the risk of being misidentified, but also from concerns that biometrics would be used to make decisions about people in a stereotypical fashion. One member of the council said, if there's a CCTV camera, you're less likely to act outside of what's acceptable because you're under observation. So you modify your own behavior, you stop being wild or as wonderful or as kinky or as strange or as bizarre, <laughs> as beautiful as you could possibly be. And no one has asked us if we want to live in that society. Finally, to address these potential harms, members of the council wanted to see strong safeguards in place. Based on potential benefits of biometrics, the council did not call for sweeping bans, but recommended establishing minimum standards and creating an authoritative body that has, quote, teeth to hold technologies to account. Given these quite strongly articulated calls for safeguards, it's important to understand where existing structures and legal frameworks come into play. As you've just heard at length, and I will not rehearse everything Matthew has just said, um, the independent legal review done by Matthew Ryder, QC, and his team finds that existing safeguards surrounding biometric data are not fit for purpose. First, where they exist, oversight structures were found to be patchy and ineffectual. Secondly, the relevant legal frameworks leave gaps. As the review notes, human rights law does not account for preventing harms before they take place in practice. Data protection law may not unequivocally cover all emerging uses of biometric data, particularly when it comes to emotion, ID, and categorization. Based on both our public engagement research that demonstrates the public demand for safeguards, and the Rider Review finding that safeguards are currently inadequate, we ultimately call for new legislation to ensure that biometric technologies, if they are to be used, work for people and society. So what do we mean by new legislation? Well, if you can squint, you may be able to discern, um, but in case not, um, to summarize, we are calling on government to pass new legislation to govern the use of biometric technologies across their true scope, so for identification and for categorization in the public sector and in the private sector. We say that the oversight and enforcement of this legislation should sit within a new regulatory function, not new regulator, note, <laughs> that focuses on biometrics specifically. In response to the council's call for transparency and accountability, the regulatory function should publish a register of public sector uses of biometric technologies, should monitor trends broadly in the market, and should also have an ombudsperson available to receive citizen and people's complaints. The primary role of the regulator is in this big number three. We think that this sorry, regulatory function should primarily assess biometric technologies on two levels. Firstly, to this question of do these technologies work? The regulatory function should require that all biometric technologies meet scientifically based and clearly established standards of accuracy, reliability, and validity. It should secondarily assess the proportionality of biometric technologies in their actual context of proposed use and before they are used or before they are deployed particularly for those that are used in the public sector, in public services, in publicly accessible spaces, or that are used to make significant decisions about people. If approval is granted, the regulatory function should monitor that technology's use over time during its deployment and implementation stages as to update, essentially, um, risks, basically, as long as the technologies are in use. Finally, there should be a moratorium on the use of biometric technologies for one-to-many identification, 
um, in publicly accessible spaces and for categorization in the public sector and for public services and in publicly accessible spaces until this comprehensive legislation is passed. This is essentially to close the loop and to prevent further harms from emerging. These technologies are impacting our lives in powerful ways, and they are spreading without a legal framework in place. We have an opportunity to act now to prevent further harms from emerging and to ensure that people have a say in how these technologies are used. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maddie. Um, because of her time constraints, I'm going to invite Chi and Wura to um, uh, I'm going to elevate you up the agenda um, because I know you have to leave shortly. Um, so it's my pleasure to um, introduce Chi, who of course is a Labour MP for Newcastle, where a couple of the Ada Lovelace Institute team members are based. Uh, she also serves as the Shadow Minister for Base and DCMS. Please join me in welcoming Chi. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thanks for inviting me and thanks for elevating me. It's nice to be elevated uh, relatively plain, painlessly, as it was. And uh, thanks for asking me to speak on the, uh, the Rider Review. And I should say that I've known Matthew since his uh, days working for, D for Sadiq as Deputy Mayor and also in regards to his work as a much respected barrister. And it's re it, we've, we've discussed the need for this review, you know, in the past and over the years in which it has taken to come to fruition. Um, and I'm really pleased to, to welcome it uh, today. It is very much needed. Um, I will just say as a caveat that this subject, if you like, biometrics, uh, the complexities of where it sits in terms of government, where it sits as part of, a, as part of government, so it's the responsibility of both the Home Office, uh, the Bays, uh, DCMS, etc. So I'm speaking as the Shadow Minister for, um, for, for Innovation and Science and Research. But I'm also speaking as a chartered engineer with over 20 years experience in tech before entering parliament. And I do want to say, I just want to start by saying, I found it deeply disturbing to follow the trajectory of tech uh, from boring, but incredibly useful, which is what it was when I graduated from Imperial, to exciting, but incredibly exploitative. And I've been dismayed almost from the day of my election, which was 12 years ago, by the lack of robust scrutiny of the role and implications of technology in our lives and the lack of an appropriate, forward-looking 21st century legislative framework. And I would say in addition, the lack even of the belief that it was possible to do so amongst some and particularly that it was possible for the public sector, you know, i.e. governments, uh, to, uh, to properly regulate technology. And I've called the absence of government action in this space uh, deeply and almost criminally negligent. And the fact that we are finally, finally discussing the first online safety bills, the first bill, first legislative piece of legislation to address the internet and the internet age, we're finally discussing that now, 12 years after the Conservatives first came into power, um, I, find, um, I, 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 I find incredible. And I, in many of this, it's not, it's, not only me, it's not only Labour, have repeatedly called for greater clarity over critical questions like the responsibilities of tech giants, like who owns slash controls the data that we all excrete in our uh, increasingly digital lives and what safeguards need to be put in place. And yeah, as a tech evangelist, that's how I always thought of myself, but uh, I found myself increasingly in the position of a Cassandra facing a government who refuses to put in place a regulatory framework that reflects the potential for harm as well as for good from technology and who critically refuses to accept that the impact of technology on society is a political choice. By, by, and biometrics, and, and th and th thank, you, thank you for explaining what biometrics are, which means that I don't need to. Um, but, but they are, um, and another uh, example, there are 
a key example today of the duality of modern technology. And the, the global biometric market is expected to grow from 35 billion pounds in 2022 to 67 billion pounds by 2027. And just to take one example, part of it, you know, many people, um, I say I was, I was in Kigali at the Commonwealth uh, meeting last week, and many people and peoples are disadvantaged by the absence of secure and credible identification. Biometrics can address this. And for the purposes of national security and uh, justice, criminal justice, it may be necessary to track people across borders. Biometrics can help there. And where identification slows things down, whether that be at the checkout when you're shopping or getting your visa approved, biometrics can speed it up. But biometrics can also delay the processes they are meant to speed up. And African visa applicants can have to travel hundreds of miles to provide them. You know, and as indeed Ukrainian refugees have also recently found, and many have their biometrics taken and used without their express or informed consent. And I think that is particularly the issue that we're dealing with today in the, in the, in the review. And, and also biometrics and particularly facial recognition represent or epitomize the distrust many of my constituents now have for technology. They feel as though they are being tracked or followed, that they may be being discriminated against. Then also a sense of power, powerlessness as the technology that they see controlling more and more of their lives. Um, you know, for the, either for the, whether that be by government or whether it be for the profit um, um, of, uh, of, compa of, of companies that use, sell and share that data. And I feel very strongly you know, that technology should not be something that is done to people. Technology should be something that uh, people that empowers and enables pe people, and people should have rights and controls as to how it is enacted. So that's why this review is so is so welcome. I'm not going to go through the details of each uh, recommend recommendation, but what I will say is that while both the European Union and the USA have been working on introducing new legislation and reg regulation in response to the rise of biometric capabilities, such as facial regu regulation. And as we've heard, UK rev regulation has been limited and, or confused. And I often say, and I worked for Ofcom, the regulator, for six years before coming into Parliament after working in the, in the private sector for, for uh, 17 years. But the opposite of good regulation you know, the opposite of regulation isn't no regulation, um, it is bad regulation. And that's why this review, I feel, is so important, because it gives us the opportunity to put in place good regulation. Uh, um, the review rightly makes reference to the infringement of the Equality Act in some uses of biometric technology, noting that more regulation is required to stop direct and indirect discrimination on the basis of any of protected characteristics. And, and I, was, I was very concerned by the um, MIT research, well, I was concerned by a number of things you've heard, but the MIT research that commercial face classification algorithms perform better on male than female faces and also on lighter than darker ones with an error rate of 35% for darker female faces. So that's me. Um, and that compares with an error rate for white male faces of 0.8%. Uh, it's an amazing difference. So I think, you know, just to, to conclude then, the rider review shows us the use and range of different types of biometric data that, that has increased during the last decade from the use of fingerprints, photos, DNA, to live facial recognition technology. And that's why I, rec I, I, um, I welcome the review's calls for just an ethical framework for biometrics to ensure a clear, accessible, and rights-compliant basis for regulation and the use of biometric technologies. Labour have long campaigned for a coherent framework for the collection and sharing of data, of which biometric data is, is, is probably the, the most uh, powerful now, but the, for the collection and sharing of data safely and securely. And I feel strongly that the government have failed to bring this in. You know, GDPR, which is much talked about and part of it are going to apparently be burned, but um, it's not fit for the age of big data. It protects privacy, not 
to a certain extent, but not, our, not, uh, not data rights. And the Labour Party believes that technology can change lives for the better, and I do want to say that, having been so, so uh, negative in some aspects, but we are clear also that the solution to the potential for abuses of personal data cannot be solved by leaving it to the uh, markets that have curated these technologies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you for making the time to come. Um, we're going to switch track now, and in, I'm really pleased to invite um, Alex Patterson, who's a member of the public who participated in the Citizens Biometrics Council. As Maddie mentioned, the council ran for eight months and involved 50 members of the public who took part in over 60 hours of deliberative workshops, and Alex is going to share his personal reflections. Thanks, Alex. Hello, I'm Alex. I'm a member of a pub the public that you've been hearing so much about. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm 36 years old. Um, in my day job, I'm a nursery manager. Um, so I do have some experience of public speaking, but you might have to bear with me because <laughs> mostly I'm reading Dear Zoo to three-year-olds. <laughs> um, but it's nice to have an audience who aren't actively picking their noses. <laughs> Which is something that facial recognition technology could pick up. And that gives us all food for thought. Um, literally food for thought. Literally food for thought. Um, I came to join the Citizens Biometrics Council through a focus group run for the LGBT community in Brighton. We were offered £50 to take part, and it was near Christmas. So that's a win-win for everybody. Other members of the council included a single parent from Cardiff, a retired businessman from rural Gloucestershire, and a second year, hum hum year humanities student, among many others. And I'd imagine it would be quite easy to see us in quite 2D terms, set types of people with set types of views. You can guess how we voted in a general election. You can guess how we voted on Brexit. Um, and we came together in a live action process that might be described as Twitter, the live show. Um, <laughs> and I think it'd be easy to think that, but I think that would be misguided. I think something ha special happens when people come together to discuss issues in society. It's harder to come into conflict with each other. Um, it's harder not to like people. Um, it's harder not to give in to that natural human tendency to want to share things. Over three separate blocks, the Citizens Biometrics Council met to consider the role of biometrics technology in our lives. We heard from the police, private companies, lobby groups for and against biometric technology, academics, the bio bio biometrics and surveillance camera commissioners. We discussed and researched. We asked questions and we mulled things over in silence. Conversations spilled over into break times and were picked up over many, many months. I found that once we'd opened the issue up, people had more views on a subject than you initially thought they would. They were capable of holding two contradictory point of views at the same time. We would often disagree with ourselves. And I'd like to assure you that the report we produced reflects the serious concerns of many individuals who came together around shared concerns, not computing voices determined to ignore each other. And although the recommendations of the council are serious and reflect the weight of our concerns, I'd also like to um, reflect that the, feeling, the report maybe doesn't engage our, doesn't reflect our full feelings as engaged participants. I think it's hard for a written report to convey the excitements and hopes we had for biometric technology. Um, in particular, I remember one presentation we had where we looked at a um, fingerprint reader that was being deployed in the developing world um, to help doctors and medical professionals access written records with people who were moving around, and it seemed like a great use of the technology. It was something we'd really want to encourage and see. Um, members could see huge potential in their own lives, be it from saving time at the bank to the supermarket to the potential to solve and reduce crime, particularly when it comes to acts of terrorism. We believe in this technology's potential. Um, in the first few weekends together, um, a clear phenomenon emerged, and I think that's worth bearing in mind when engaging with the public. And we, we described this as the minority report effect. So the Tom Cruise film where technologies used by a specialist police department to um, 
predict crimes before they're committed. Um, and this played out as a continual overestimation of the capabilities of biometric technology. Members of the public seem to assume that it can do way more than it actually can. A company came to speak to us about facial recognition, um, which they were developing for age verification purposes. And I remember the audible gasps around the room when I asked the company representative um, why they used facial recognition technology over fingerprints. And the, the representative went on to explain that fingerprint technology was not yet regarded as entirely secure, with her own teenage daughter being easily able to unlock her phone. That's to say nothing of gait analysis, identifying people through the way they walk, mm -hmm. um, the suggested use of which would be for airports and those sorts of environments. And my understanding is that's currently about as accurate as predicting the future by looking at the entrails of rabbits or tea leaves. <laughs> um, I believe that after these presentations, we came to a watchful scepticism. We wanted the technology to function as it was intended to do, but we were not sure it always did. In our second weekend together, we spent more time considering the impact of biometrics on a range of groups in society. This included the perspectives from several council members, a financial manager who's black spoke movingly about his experience of being regularly stopped and searched by the police. Linked to this, many of us were alarmed to hear that facial recognition could already be said to be an explicitly racist technology. This is because much of the technology uses data sets skewed towards white male faces in Silicon Valley to inform its algorithms. Another council member bravely stood up and disclosed to the room her MS diagnosis. She told us how the disease had now reached a stage where she was finding it hard to form her signature. She feared that one day soon, she would no longer be able to use the fingerprint recognition on her phone, that she would be locked out in more ways than one. <coughs> Alongside our other assumptions, many of us had arrived believing that the, the technology we, was there to make our lives easier. And at this point in our journey, we were starting to recognize that the people developing and operating the technology bring influences and biases that potentially compromise its application. Between our second and third weekends, we were interrupted by a tiny little global pandemic. <laughs> Don't know if any of you remember it. Um, a nine month gap elapsed before we reconvened our discussions online. And as with um, everything, COVID-19 had transformed our views and our way of thinking. Um, many saw um, biometrics as a potential route out of social distancing restrictions, such as through vaccine passports. Others, like me, were quite worried about the level of state control that was revealed in our lives. And, and I think Ada Lovelace herself would have disagreed with me. I felt that maybe we should just turn the whole internet off. <laughs> um, not only had our views changed, but our style of engagement had as well. Um, for some, it was easier to make our views heard in an online space, where others tended to hold back a bit more. My abiding memory of this final stage was the sincerity and passion with which many members put forward their perspectives. Um, as informed citizens, and I'd be a strong advocate for this process within society, um, we'd really come to care about this issue. We worked our way through our own ignorance and illusions. We indulged our hopes and dreams about the technology and at times our paranoia as well. We had all been through stages of scepticism and concern about how biometrics are deployed. And there's one final factor I'd like to consider before I finish, that of apathy. I think it's something of a paradox that the ease with which this technology can be accessed and used agitates against critical engagement in society about the effects of this technology on people and communities. Council members often spoke about biometric technology with a sense of resignation and inevitability. It's going to happen anyway, and can we really do anything about it? And you might remember I mentioned I'm a nursery nurse. I'd like a uh, nursery manager, um, underselling myself. <laughs> I'd like you to know that I've encountered toddlers who are so at home with smartphones and tablets that they will flick at books to the turn the page. Um, what sort of views of biometric technology are they going to have? What sort of critical relationship will they have with it in 30 years' time? For me, I believe that every law-abiding citizen should have a fundamental right to anonymity. 
However, it's clear that the evolving reach of biometric technology means we can no longer take this for granted. We also have an insight into the future, into what future generations will be unable to access in the same way, a time before the internet. Actions we take around this technology now have the potential to affect the very future of humanity. I hope attendees at this event will reflect as seriously as we did on the Citizens Biometrics Council about our recommendations. These were that government should develop more comprehensive legislation and regulation of biometric technologies, establish an independent authoritative body to provide robust oversight and ensure minimum standards for their design and deployment. Thank you very much. Alex, we were so lucky to have Alex in the Citizens Biometrics Council, and those are some lucky three-year-olds as well, I think. <laughs> um, I'm very pleased now to uh, invite Baroness Hamwee to the stand. Baroness Hamwee was appointed a life peer in 1991, and since April 2021, she has chaired the Justice and Home Affairs Select Committee. In March of this year, the committee published an important report on the advent of new technologies in the justice system. And that report called for new legislation to address technologies like predictive policing as well as facial recognition. So please welcome Baroness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's a new committee, or it was then, and this is the very first piece of work that we've done and the first report that, that we've published. Thank you for asking me, because one always learns an awful lot I didn't know about the analysis of gate, um, mm -hmm. goodness. The committee is cross-party, um, and our report was unanimous. Um, parliamentary reports generally are, actually. Um, but I don't think we were finding a lowest common denominator. I'm a Liberal Democrat. Um, I really welcome this report, um, because your report and ours are very much on all fours. We were looking at uh, technology, new technologies in the justice sector, but we found that we pretty much confined ourselves to policing with a dash of border control. We decided we weren't going to look at how technologies are used in court, I mean, in the court process, you know, video links and so on, for instance. I particularly welcome the underpinning of public engagement I think that's a terrific way to, to go about it because this involves all of us, not just specialists. I don't know, Alex, whether you detected among colleagues any deference to computers initially, to computers, literally that, rather than technology. The computer must be right. It was something we were worried about in the way the police um, use um, technology. And we actually had in mind, though it's different tech, uh, what happened with the post office, which seemed to us to be have happened because, well, it's computers, so it must be right. Matthew, you said, um, rejecting it, something that we also rejected. Well, if there's a problem, the courts can sort it out. And we heard that quite a lot, frankly, from people I don't think we should have heard it from. One needs to get these things right in advance. It's, that's not the role of the courts to sort this sort of thing out. Um, we were throughout concerned that humans should be taking decisions. Now, that might not be how you'd see it, I, I, I don't know, but the final decision should be taken by humans. And the Home Secretary said that to us several times, um, but they're not. The committee, none of the committees, uh, the committee members, as far as I'm aware, is a scientist or an ethicist, I, I don't mean we're not ethical, but not ethicists, not specialists of any kind. And I actually, I think that's a good thing, and probably in the same sort of way as with your, your council. 
pretty much the first comment, I think, that any of the members made after we'd had an initial presentation um, from academics about what was out there, what's happening, was, I'm terrified. Um, that's not a bad thing either. None of us on the committee, I think, is a, a natural imposer of regulation, but that was where we came to, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. We were all, we are all, I think, keen supporters of innovation, innovation but not at any cost. And we heard some very alarming stories, mainly from California, I think, about abusive selling practices, companies making um, body-worn cameras um, who were harvesting data Nobody thought about who owns the, the data. Um, uh, with um, contracts with police forces, which, for instance, provided that, um, you know, they got, these were loss leaders, um, but an awful lot of money required to continue a contract after a, a couple of years. So what happens in, it's not very original, but what happens in the Wild West that, that seems to have been created was also a worry to us. Um, the, the government has just responded to our report, and of course I should be saying it's available on the parliamentary website under the, on the page for the Justice and Home Affairs Committee. Um, I can't pretend to be um, happy with the government's response. Um, they seem to think that we are against innovation and progress, and that's not the case at all. Um, it occurred to me this morning that my problem, anyway, is that innovation should not take centre stage and leave to walk on roles. Ethics, transparency, standards, proportionality, bias and discrimination, you will be familiar with that whole landscape. Um, and that, it seems to me, is to miss the point that all of those have such an important role because you want public trust and confidence in what we as a society um, are subject to, if you like. And it misses the complexity of all this. Um, we need a framework for innovation, not simply to say, well, that's so important that the rest of it is, is secondary. So I'm sorry that the, the government, we're yet to have a, a, a debate about this, should see um, us as being anything other than wanting positive progress. There is a hugely diffuse landscape of organizations involved in this area, and we, this is just policing. We identified 30 different organizations. Well, you can imagine how hard it is to understand what the governance is, um, or, or how you ha hold anyone to um, account. I asked someone um, working with the police towards the end of the um, our evidence sessions, uh, whether he could provide a family tree of the organizations that were relevant. And he went slightly pale and said, well, I think it would be more like a family bush. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed it is. Um, so safeguards. Safeguards need specificity, if that's a word. And one of the um, uh, responses from the government is to agree that the use of technologies in the criminal justice system must be safe and ethical. For policing specifically, there are already many safeguards. The data protection, equalities, and human rights framework set by Parliament has created a principle-based framework. Well, yes, but it's a framework for a framework, it seems to us. Um, we were hearing, for instance, that a police chief 
um, acquiring a new system would have in mind human rights. Well, that's actually quite an unspecific thing to be saying and quite a hard thing to require. And the accountability um, is with the um, uh, police and crime commissioners. Um, well, I imagine that there's a very varied uh, level of interest among police and crime commissioners in this subject, and you can't expect them to be experts what we ended up thinking that we were proposing, what we were proposing effectively, was um, a system which would allow police forces to select products, but products which they had the confidence to know met the standards which we think are right. I mean, I'm not speaking against localism in policing. For instance, I think it's really important, and different products will be of different of use to different forces. Um, but to allow 43 police forces, or require 43 police forces to make their own decisions, I think is um, not appropriate. So we propose legislation as a basis for detailed regulations a body to set specific um, scientific validity and quality standards, a national register of technologies that are in use, and certification of products, a kite mark if you like, um, and a duty of candor on the police. Um, Alex, you, you end, more or less ended by saying that you wanted a, a, a function that is as good as it can and should be, and does it, well, we don't think it meets that, and we too think that it should. So thank you. Thank you so much. And um, with much mm. gratitude for his patience, I would now like to invite <laughs> Professor Fraser Sampson to be our final speaker for this afternoon. Um, Fraser is, of course, the Biometrics and Surveillance Camera Commissioner. He has over 40 years' experience working in the criminal justice sector, having served as a police officer for 19 years before, coming, bef before becoming a solicitor specialising in policing law. He's an honorary professor and member of the advisory board at the Centre for Excellence in Terrorism, Resilience, Intelligence and Organised Crime Research at Sheffield Hallam University. Thank you so much for joining us, Fraser. Polly, thank you very much. Thank you. As, as uh, two commissioners, one for biometrics, the other surveillance cameras, I realise I stand here as much as an exhibit, as a witness <laughs> to the growing overlap between these areas. And in that context, I guess I am the walking embodiment of, if not simplification, then at least a form of reductivism. Um, and I was described recently in the House of Lords as highly qualified but thinly spread, um, <laughs> which I suppose is preferable to the other way around. Um, Fifteen months into my uh, uh, two-year spreading, this, this report comes at a timely moment, and I'm very grateful for the invitation to its, to its launch. Much of what we understand comes from perspective, and people who've worked with me and heard me speak before will know that I generally tend to stand at three different vantage points to look at the, the many things that are covered by my, my two roles. Um, the first is the technological, what can be done. The second is the legal, what must and must not be done. And the third is the societal, which is what people will support or even tolerate being done. In terms of the technology, biometric capability could revolutionise the investigation and prevention of crime and the prosecution of offenders. The way in which that technology is used could also jeopardise our very model of policing. Public space surveillance is no longer about deciding where to put your camera. It's about what you do with the millions of images and other biometric information captured by everyone's camera. When it needed a human to analyze it, there was simply too much biometric information and data to manage. But the technology now means that actors are able to tap into an aggregated surveillance capability that is vast and growing. We're now experiencing what one lawyer called omnivalence over a decade ago. Virtually everyone has access to biometric surveillance capabilities 
that were once the preserve of state intelligence agencies, and they're using them. I think there is, potentially, a case for facial recognition technology, yes, even live facial recognition technology in some extreme policing circumstances. I also think that the same technology can be used to frustrate policing, to interfere with witness relocation, for example, and to disrupt covert operations. So what does the law say about all this? The first thing it says is that there are many facets to it, and the report sets them out in some detail. One facet, which comes under my statutory functions, is the surveillance camera code. And that emphasizes very clearly the importance of any public space surveillance being legitimate and carried out, quote, in a way that the public rightly expect and to a standard that maintains their trust and confidence. So how do we know what the public rightly expect? And have we asked them? What are the standards that will maintain their trust and confidence in the surveillance technology? Where are they to be found and who sets them? We know one thing that the public will rightly expect, that the police are able to show how they've had regard to the code of practice, and that's because the code expressly says that it's a legitimate public expectation that they will. So the burden of proof lies very much with the police, and legitimate expectation is, as we know, a ground for judicial review. This is why I've just written to all police chiefs in England and Wales, asking for evidence of legitimacy and compliance, and we'll be writing to local authorities in the same vein very shortly. It's also clear that our landscape is the product, not of some eureka policy moment, but rather the battleground of litigation by citizens asking proper pertinent questions and getting either an unsatisfactory answer or no answer at all. The review confirms how we are still dependent on litigation to set the boundaries and still misunderstand yet where those boundaries are. Which brings me possibly to the most important, a third perspective, which is what is acceptable or even tolerable to the citizen. Now this is changing because the technology is changing. So too is our awareness of and attitude towards its use. In order to comply with the surveillance camera code, you need to know what your community finds acceptable, which is a key role for elected local policing bodies, deputy mayors and police and crime commissioners. And if you're gonna rely on a citizen's implied consent, it's important that you understand what level of support you enjoy in this area. The technology is also changing the surveillance relationship between the citizen and the state. The first police communication following an incident is now often an appeal for any images that people may have captured on their GoPros, dash cams, shed cams, ring doorbells. We now see the police needing not just biometric information about the citizen, but also from the citizen and from businesses and from employers. And this has profound implications for the biometric relationship between the citizen and the state. So I think we should attend to that relationship because we're going to need each other. One area where all three perspectives come together, the technological, the legal and the societal, and they come into sharp relief, is artificial intelligence. AI and surveillance comes in many forms, exciting mixture of fascination and fear. I've heard people say that their AI technology is simply too complicated to explain. And that even their designers don't really understand how it works. Well, if you're demonstrating that you've met your public equality duty, that you've avoided bias and are in no way perpetuating unlawful discrimination, that won't do. If you're relying on automated decision-making, that won't do. And if, like the police, you're putting ethics at the heart of your every action, that won't do either. Sheffield Hallam University, we've developed an accountability framework for the use of AI in law enforcement. And the methodology that we use there included a citizen survey across 30 different countries with different legal systems and cultures in which 80% of respondents ranked the need for a universal accountability framework governing police use of AI as either important or extremely important. Transparency and explainability are keystones of public trust and confidence. And whether it's your technology or your company's trading history, if it's too opaque to, opaque to be understood by the citizen who is funding it and purportedly benefiting from it, the problem isn't the citizen. 
So in conclusion, technological development in biometrics has meant our ability to prepare for, respond to, and recover from critical incidents on a global level has increased beyond anything our forebears might have imagined. At the same time, it has created dependencies and vulnerabilities on a similar scale. If society is to get the most from its biometric surveillance technology, it's going to need a systemic approach. And it's, that means integrity of both technology and practice, along with the standards of everything and everyone in it. Because in a systemic setting, if you infect one part, you infect it all. So looking to the future, Parliament may decide to treat all this as a data protection matter. Of course, biometric surveillance uses individuals' data, which public or private function doesn't. It's a bit like saying that it uses electricity. Biometric surveillance is no more just data protection than DNA profiling just chemistry or facial recognition just photography. In his valedictory report, as HM Chief Inspector Constabulary Tom Windsor says, policing needs a material intensification of partnership with the private sector, soundly and enduringly based on trust and common interest. And for me, nowhere is that truer than in the area of biometric surveillance. In a world where almost all our biometric capability is in private ownership, we need to be very careful whose corporate company we keep. Because if our surveillance partnerships are not soundly and enduringly based on trust and common interest, we are in a lot of trouble, which is why I believe that the Public Procurement Bill is so important in this area. We now have an opportunity to do something momentous. Will we be led by thoughtful and courageous planning, or will we wait to be sued into further submission, either by regulators or by the citizen? Policy is for others, but practically, we need a set of clear, indefeasible principles by which the police will be held to account for their use of biometrics transparently and auditably. There are many different models and ways to achieve this, but for me, the acid test for all and any of them will be whether they ensure that biometric technology, the what is possible, is only being used for legitimate authorised purposes, what is permissible, and in a way that the citizen is prepared to support what is acceptable. I very much welcome this significant and credible report and thank you for the invitation to speak today.